Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's Carlos Koharik here from the RIBA Journal, uh, and welcome to our PIP webinar series on office developments. Um, thank you for joining us. You're probably all joining us, no doubt, from, or most of you still from your homes. And uh, given that everything's been, you know, restricted now, continuing until July the 19th, looks like we'll be doing that for a little longer. Um, so I suppose the idea of where we're going really in terms of office design is uh, really um, top most of people's minds, I suppose. Everybody in, in the last 15, 16, 16 months have had their lives turned around really. And ways of living and working, which we probably didn't even imagine less than two years ago, are now becoming absolutely the norm. N not least for myself, uh, I don't think we'll be returning to the office until around September and I think that that's kind of forced really major changes to all of us really about how we the kind of lives that we live and I think a complete reappraisal really about how we kind of societally um, go forward in our in our world of work. Um, so thank you for joining us again. This seminar is going to be offering us insights really into all this latest thinking on the future of workspaces. We're going to imagine how office use and design has been impacted by the pandemic and be looking at case studies from architectural experts and practices and looking at award winning office developments. The majority of which I'll say probably happened pre 2020, um, but certainly some interesting projects to be looking at. And we can probably ask about how they're being used now actually. We'll also cover the latest products and materials and explore how collaboration between architects, consultants and manufacturers are helping create better designed, inclusive, inspiring and sustainable office developments. Um, given that I, much as I enjoyed it, I managed to overrun by about, you know, not far off one hour the last time I did this. I am just a word of housekeeping to all these speakers actually, not and myself. Um, that I will probably be trying to keep you all to timings because uh, obviously people are busy. They are, you know, whether they're home, well, not homeschooling anymore, but um, that uh, people, you know, have deadlines. So I'll make sure that I will try and keep within the timing. So we should um, hopefully be finished by 11.15. Um, and at 9.03, I'm feeling quite good on the timing at the moment. Um, I would just like to introduce our first speaker, who is Amy Frierson, who's a writer, editor and speaker specialising in architecture and design. Uh, she's editor at large for Design and contributes to magazines including Elle Decoration, Grand Designs and Icon. Uh, she holds a Master's in Architectural History from the Bartlett and a degree in Architecture from Kingston. Uh, we are going to be talking about her latest book, actually, that she did in collaboration, well, co-authored with Naomi Cleaver, uh, entitled All Together Now, The Co-Working and Co-Living Revolution. Now, we've just had, a, in a brief introduction earlier, to uh, um, an understanding that the book was actually written pre-pandemic, so the idea that, uh, or was starting to be written pre-pandemic, and was probably completed during it. So I think there's probably going to be a lot of observations from her, really, about how life was then and how it is now. Um, very prescient kind of book to be uh, producing at this stage. Uh, also be aware that the uh, book is going to be available at a 20% discount uh, with a discount code if you buy it through Reba Publishing, a Reba Bookshop. Uh, so, are you there, Amy? I'm just trying to see if I can see you. Hi there. <laughs> Hello, Amy. Hiya. <laughs> Hi, Carlos. Uh, how are you doing? <laughs> thank you for joining us this morning. Um, I was going to say, when I said earlier, we met at the 2015 Milan Expo, where my remembrance of you actually was um, running around on our press trip, running around between various pavilions, asking where the best, best broadband was. So um, it kind of made me wonder whether Dazeem was actually overworking you. So uh, maybe give us a bit of a view about how hard it was working then and whether your life has actually changed. I'm quite interested really in how your own work life balance has changed as a result of all of this. Uh, I suppose quite significantly, 
I think, yeah, I made the made the sort of switch to freelance after eight years of being full time at the scene, right. about six months before the pandemic. So I was really just finding my feet as a as a freelancer when when um, when things changed. But I mean, sort of, yeah, this this book was sort of a big project that I kind of had in, you know, was sort of working on and sort of was just about to sort of get stuck into just when when things happened. So um, it was definitely a kind of, I guess, it sort of a bit of a change, a change of gear and sort of a, a bit of a new challenge in trying to work out how to, yeah, how to operate in a completely different way on sort of something that, you know, was a sort of a three month project as opposed to sort of working so hard to get several new stories out every day. Yeah, yeah. And how did you find it actually in lockdown? I mean, how has that been? How's it kind of felt for you to in terms of your work life balance? How is it? How has that kind of affected you? Um. I've probably been probably been better than most supposedly. I mean, I don't have any children, so I don't uh, have sort of childcare to deal with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I also, I mean, sort of uh, in sort of light of the book, I, I I share a sort of a small studio. I have a small co-working space uh, that I share with um, now sort of six. There's six of us, so we're a very small community anyway. So I think it was a lot easier for us when things were starting to ease to be able to kind of be back in the studio working together as yeah. opposed to being in a sort of a huge office. So, um, and also sort of writing this book, everyone being, uh, everyone being kind of confined to their homes, it was a lot easier to pin people down for interviews. Oh, possibly. Yeah, I think yeah. it might have been in, in usual times. <laughs> the downside being that I didn't get to visit nearly as many of the projects in the book as I had originally planned to. Yeah, um, shame because sometimes you need that kind of experiential aspect to it. Really, kind of enriches the writing as well, doesn't it? Yeah, I think I did a few, uh, I did a few Zoom tours of buildings where someone held a laptop and walked me around the building, um, which was uh, definitely something a bit different. Yeah, I mean, it was interesting because I was uh, like mid uh, twenty nineteen, so probably about six months before lockdown. I, I, I went over to Berlin to take a look at for. Um, for Pip, actually, I went over to take a look at Brandel Huber and Emder's um, Loeb block um, in the centre of Berlin, which is basically this kind of massive concrete ziggurat, which is in, in that really kind of wonderful Berlin way, ended up being both flats, you know, flats people were living in, co-working spaces with enormous terraces on this ziggurat, lower level gallery space, you know, one bit was a gallery space, another bit was a really lovely kind of organic cafe, there was little allotments in the corner. I mean, a total kind of, I'm about to say Berlin typology, I mean, clearly not, but something quite Berlin about it, very contingent. And it was a really thrilling space to walk around with the client with. It was actually an artist from the UK who ended up, who originally bought this site and decided to effectively create a form of artistic community. It was a really thrilling building to walk around and to kind of experience and see and kind of look at these identical kind of concrete units, but each one being used in different ways, some being lived in, some being used as offices. And uh, it kind of brings me back to the book, really, which is the whole idea about how exciting the idea of merging these, you know, not having the idea of separate, you know, in the idea, traditional idea of use classes where you've got residential and you've got retail or you've got commercial space or whatever, but the idea that actually this wonderful kind of Sue generis amalgam of all of them can produce really exciting spaces. So give us a bit of an idea or a bit of a flavour really about the book and what you what you were trying to kind of like um, tell us about them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so sort of, yeah, Naomi and I kind of embarked on this project together. Naomi was sort of involved first um, as she's sort of really experienced um, in the sector already. Um, and she sort of drafted me into kind of uh, to, to help her out on it. Um, and really the sort of idea was and actually, maybe I should kind of quote. So I wrote the introduction to the book, yeah, long before the pandemic. And the first line in the in the in the introduction is sort of stayed stayed the same throughout, uh, which is the definitions of home and workplace are blurring. Um, you know, little do we know how much they were going to blur uh, over the course of uh, over the course of sort of past eighteen months. Um, but there's so many kind of there are so many kind of trends that are kind of shaping our you know, the way that we live and work, um, sort of, I mean, I've got a kind of a list of few of the list of them here, but obviously sort of, you know, the rise of technology, sort of mobile technology, the ability to kind of live and work anywhere, 
uh, not to mention the sharing economy, you know, Uber, Airbnb, this ability to kind of have things on demand and, and share share facilities in this way. Um, you know, um, that's sort of a one, one sort of major thing that's sort of changed. Um, and then like, you know, more and more people are living alone. So loneliness has become a huge, a huge issue. Um, and then also, you know, we have rising property paces. We have like lack of available space in cities. So this idea, like these kind of trends were already kind of pushing in this direction before. Um, and so I was just really interested in this idea of what I'm now calling co-space. Um, I wish I'd called it that in the book because I feel like uh, the term kind of came together later, but it's the idea that, um, different types of shared space can exist, you know, in, in all our, in all of our lives. And that doesn't necessarily have to mean giving up privacy, you know, our kind of, I guess what we consider our kind of traditional relationship between home space and workspace is this idea that, you know, that your home space is something very private. Um, and then your workspace is something that used to being quite social. And then in reality, you know, and through the pandemic, um, and the home space has become the home space has then and become the workspace as well. So both have become this sort of private space, and it's been kind of really tough for people. This idea of missing that sociability, um, and then in reality, actually, what makes better sense for a kind of well-being really is the idea that you might have in both your live in both your kind of home space and your workspace some spaces for privacy and some spaces for sharing. And so, this sort of book was really just exploring different models of how you know, sharing and privacy can kind of exist alongside each other in different ways. How do you, how does the book kind of take it beyond the traditional kind of accepted notions, I suppose, of what we view, you know, if people talk about kind of like co-working spaces, I suppose the immediate thought is places like WeWork or the office group, you know, those spaces where you're kind of like, you know, short term lets, you go in there, you kind of, they are very exciting spaces actually, and obviously they are, um, uh, you know, completely on trend, even though I do think at some point, you know, WeWork was kind of a little bit at its zenith and then going down come the end of 2019. But how much further does your book take those ideas of how we should imagine what future office spaces or co-working spaces are like? I think ultimately, like, there's, a, there's quite a lot of stigma, probably more towards co-living than co-working because of the sort of the kind of question of privacy. But I think people have quite set ideas in their mind about what these models, you know, should be or, or are. And that they fit a sort of a certain character, a certain type of person. Um, and then in reality, like, and what this sort of book, I guess, is hoping to sort of show is there are so many different models for, for, the, for how these things exist. I mean, one of the one of the chapters in the book um, looks at kind of what we kind of I kind of calling uh, live work hybrids, which is sort of this idea of um, kind of the digital nomad, the sort of person that, you know, that I guess there's this kind of there's this image of this uh, this figure that you know has a laptop and doesn't maybe have a fixed address yeah, and sort of yeah, travels yeah. the world and maybe lives in one place for three months and moves somewhere else and you know just moves to where where work is and I think like models like that exist very in sort of few but there's also like a lot more nuanced nuanced things it's just the idea that people are like more mobile and might be traveling you know some just maybe going to study somewhere for three to six months um and so want to kind of be able to have workspace that works for them, you know, while they're away and then be able to come back. So it's very much, I guess, about how the relationship between the workspace fit together in that sense. Um, how much do you think, I mean, you use, a, you take example, I mean, I think there's, you use one example the project in Hoxton, isn't it, as one of your main kind of case study, one of your case studies. You, the rest of the seem to be abroad. Do you think that the use classes in the UK and that idea that we tend to be very kind of um, uh, siloed in our thinking, you know, you either have commercial space, you have residential areas, that way of, of planning that we use in the UK system. Um, do you think that actually works against this idea of the blurring of boundaries? Or do, do you think that's why you're seeing better examples in, in, in abroad? The idea that maybe they've got a planning system which is slightly more open to the idea that you can have these kind of blurred boundaries in a way that we don't seem to kind of take on board here? I've, I've looked into it a little bit more. I mean, I'd say like Europe probably has has equally, maybe they're maybe in some places like a little bit further ahead than us, but I do think our kind of strict view on use classes does hold us back. I mean, use classes are important. They serve, you know, if we if we didn't have them, we, 
you know, we, we couldn't imagine what our sort of cities, how things would work. So, you know, they do exist and they do serve an important purpose, but I think they do very much restrict our, our thinking sometimes. Um, and I think as, you know, going forward, like we are going to be looking at more kind of flexible, you know, flexible working setups. Um, we need, we need homes and workspaces to be able to kind of adapt to that. You know, we, we hear stories that like a lot of, a lot of big companies may, you know, not necessarily go back to having fixed offices, but may maybe just have some of their staff working in co-working spaces part of the time when they need to come together and then home part of the time. Um, and, you know, that has various benefits, you know, not just being able to kind of come together with, to collaborate, but also to kind of be in a space with other kind of, you know, other, other companies, other creatives and kind of feeding off of each other. So that's kind of one, one model where things are going to, be changing a little bit. Um, I think ultimately sort of like the more flexibility we can allow for in the planning system, you know, the more the more yeah. kind of new models and more kind of more kind of ways of uh, of living and working together we can kind of explore. You can I mean you do talk about this, I mean you talk about the you know the 21st century's culture of overwork dealing with a broken housing mar market chronic loneliness particularly among the elderly raising these themes in the book do you genuinely think that kind of changes in in in, in the concepts of co-working can really sort of start to look at these i mean they're pretty major issues all of them i mean you know 21st century loneliness cultures of overwork and broken housing that's quite a that's quite a few you know ticked boxes if you're managing to kind of address all of those issues i think as i think ultimately like the kind of what what i kind of hope to kind of explain with this book is like there really is no one fits all approach to anything that like we kind of what can only be better is having more options for people more flexibility um it, i mean taking loneliness as kind of one example you know like loneliness is kind of as a real kind of 21st century problem that has emerged of the fact that yeah. actually you know this book is talking about sharing spaces but like that's kind of almost a reaction against the fact that more people live alone than than ever before you know it's it's a growing trend um and that's you know for a myriad of of reasons um you know people aren't maybe settling down till later in life um you know like people like divorce is more common you know there's so there's there's so many kind of reasons for that and then sort of when you know something like the pandemic hits and then those people are kind of then forced into a situation where they're stuck you know stuck at home living and working in that shared space um you know loneliness is going to be an issue and so like finding ways that finding ways that you can have the benefits that you get of kind of being at home but also being in shared you know that you get from sort of being with, around other people is really important yeah well in the major um and how do you think that good design enables us to fully adapt to working where we live, plus adapt to the extra need of shared living space with extended family or, or friends? I mean, how do you, how do you kind of space, I mean, what are the ideas of how you spatially kind of adapt, you know, home spaces, for instance, the idea that we might be able to kind of use them as proper working environments, functioning working environments? It's a difficult question because ultimately, you know, the obvious question is the obvious answer is more space, but we, more space can't be the solution. Like there isn't, you know, we can't just say we need our homes to be bigger. Like it doesn't necessarily work um, for environments. And that's kind of why I do think kind of like kind of different kinds of shared living models can make a real and can kind of really change that that setup. I mean, there are sort of some projects I've seen. Um, there are a few that have been kind of completed recently. Um, were you going to show us some examples of it? I'm not quite sure whether I should have been allowing you time to actually do that. Oh, uh, we can do that in a second. But yeah, maybe it'd be nice <laughs> in a moment to show some examples. But yeah, there are you can you, there are kind of examples now of like co-living spaces that include co-working spaces. I mean, even just taking a, um, the sort of the, what, the sort of example that a lot of people are familiar with is kind of I guess like the kind of poster boy for co-living, um, which is the collective. Um, and so like one of the case studies in my book is the collective space in Canary Wharf, which actually I didn't put any pictures on my presentation, but they sort of, um, they reported that during the pandemic, like actually things were great because everyone had a sort of, yes, the sort of individual units that people lived in were kind of, you know, they're essentially like micro homes, but they have dedicated 
dedicated space for living and working within them but then also people had access to this kind of bigger community that, that they could kind of um come out come out into you know when they were sort of able to sort of not fully get back out and about again but you know they had like co they have uh, co-living um co-working spaces in the building that people can access so the idea that you could then be able to go and like share you know go out and work in your building and have those facilities on site for you because you share them with the other people that you live with and then you then go back to your kind of living space it's kind of taking advantage of econ economies of scale is a really kind of clever way and that you know we can adapt to things and that can be something just very simple as just like you know through the pandemic the idea of like access to outdoor space you know just having sort of an outdoor space that you share with other people is a kind of a, an easy model of how you um of how you kind of share and get something more yeah 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 mm. I mean, maybe what yeah. you I mean, we should be actually um, doing audience Q and A because I was actually supposed to be telling the, uh, the audience you can ask Amy questions yourself. They don't just need to be mine. Um, but in the meantime, I think it'd be good if we could take a look at a few of your slides. It'd be nice to see, you know, envisaging, you know, you know, in the five minutes we have, what you, what insights you take from it, really. Absolutely. So I've put together. Um, just share my screen. Uh, yeah. So I put together a, a quick run through and obviously these are a mix of kind of, they're mainly living spaces because it's thinking about that relationship between living and working. So this first one is um, an example of a, of a house um, designed for, for renting, for private renting. And it's thinking about thinking about the idea of like the shared, the shared home, you know, the shared flat, which in London in particular is a kind of common thing and probably was like a real pressure point for people during the pandemic because like if you share with three or four other people, suddenly you're working from home and how does that work? Um, so this this space has two main kind of living spaces um, and I should see in the next slide. Um, so it has a kind of an upstairs space mm -hmm. and a downstairs space and the idea that sort of the upstairs space can kind of function as a co-working space for, for people that live in the home, whereas the downstairs is more of a social space and how they might, you know, how they can kind of swap around if needs be. It's kind of giving that flexibility and one of the big kind of tips, and this kind of works for kind of co-living and co-working um, in many ways, this idea of like one of my kind of main tips for sharing spaces, um, acoustic separation, but, but visual, but like um, having some visibility. So being able to see other activities going on around you and not necessarily being able to hear them is a great way of kind of being able to kind of feel connected to other people in a space, mm -hmm. but also to kind of um, you know to have the privacy that you need to kind of get your head down and focus on to focus on your work um this is um this is the next example is a co-housing community um in copenhagen um and one of the big things that it has is this kind of um this kind of and it's kind of a common thing in common thing in kind of co-housing is to have a kind of a shared house like a common house where the people that live here come together and this particular project was um uh, it was a group of people who like kind of uh, came together and kind of funded the project and they'd all kind of grown up in kind of communes in Denmark and were really kind of adamant they didn't want to have that kind of commune feel. Um, but the idea they kind of create this common house where meals are created for the families so, and they have this kind of great network of being able to kind of, you know, ask other families for babysitting and other shared activities. So it kind of gives them the freedom. So if you needed to be able to have that space to work from home, you know, you kind of can... Uh, you, you, you don't have to be worrying about making dinner or like you can kind of help you can you know help out with sort of looking after your your neighbor's children just to sort yeah. of it's kind of like creating that feeling of neighborliness that's been kind of growing in the pandemic and like actually creating an, a model that means that your ability to then work to find the space that you need to work from home is is there um this is a student housing project um some maybe some um Maybe this will be my last project if we have time for audience questions. But this is a this is a sort of student housing project where um, they're really thinking about how spaces can be designed for flexibility for different purposes. So they have these kind of lounges where you know the kind of classic sort of um, slightly kind of cliche the idea that you have have ping pong tables is sort of this fun thing. But ultimately, these ones are all designed to actually be work tables. Like they're they're places where people can sit down and work mm -hmm. during the day. Yeah. So they have this this other um this this ability to be super functional but also to be used for different purposes um and that's kind of one of the things we've looked at a lot in the book is kind of how like kind of just 
clever approaches to design to furniture can just kind of make spaces so much more flexible. Um, and then, yeah, this is another one of the spaces in this building where they have um, they have a gym upstairs and then they have this kind of co-working kind of living lounge space um, where like a lot of people kind of come and work, um, but then they might prepare meals while they're there, you know, like while they're kind of working, but then they can kind of come together with other people, Either, you know, if they want to kind of be able to have a workspace where they can kind of collaborate with others, it still feels like a home space. I think it does that very well. Mm -hmm. And you have the sort of the gym above, so people can kind of look down on there and sort of see how things happening on it. It comes back to, again, that example of um, kind of acoustic privacy, but, but visibility. I won't just click through any of the others. I think we probably don't have time unless you think that, that we do. <laughs> well, I mean, we do have a question from Matt here that says, uh, Amy, have you experienced any models in your travels or research that start to share or have community local discounts for residents across the ground floor commercial units across large build to rent master plans? <laughs> Can you repeat that? That's quite a long question. <laughs> Um, have you experienced any models in your travels research that start to share or have community local discounts for residents across the ground floor commercial units across large BTR master plans? So I suppose the idea that if you're living above it, that you are effectively part of that retail or commercial community and therefore you, you reap the benefits of living above those spaces because they effectively treat you as neighbours. I suppose that's what he's... That's I think I possibly don't have a BTR example in that, but I do have actually one of my next examples is kind of maybe sort of interesting on that theme. Oh no, it's not this one, it's the next one. So this is um this is one of the, this is an example um of a project like I was saying before. So rather than being like a kind of a full-time kind of living or you know, sort of BTR or various other types of kind of living model, this is a kind of work retreat idea. Um this is a, this is in a, a village in Serbia. And um it's kind of yeah, it's built as a work retreat and this idea that you have um there's a series of buildings designed around like lovely outside spaces. And it's mainly used, yeah, they have sort of people from outside coming in, but they also open up the facilities to locals. So they, in addition to kind of having, um, in addition to having, you know, people coming coming to this to this area from, from outside, from anywhere in the world to kind of come and work, they also have, um, they give, they offer free co-working facilities to locals in a bid to kind of boost the local economy and oh, create this right. kind of idea of sort of skill sharing, which is kind of fantastic. So it, I find it a kind of really interesting example of how this idea of kind of bringing people into a place, um, you know, it's kind of that opposite of that sort of gentrification model. It's like actually bringing people in to, can actually kind of provide a boost to, to the local area. Um, and it's been hugely popular in that respect. And they have all these kind of, incredibly sort of versatile spaces that can be used for everything from sort of simple working to kind of presentations. I think they have quite a lot of kind of uh, office kind of team building exercises there as well. Um, so maybe that isn't quite the sort yeah, of example no. that, that answers yeah. the questions, but I think it's sort of yeah. a really kind of valid, I think it, it always just comes you're back. Bringing the community, you know, your, your community is being absorbed, a wider community is being absorbed within the building itself. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think, I think it's ultimately sort of, these kinds of projects have to look at how they're um, how they're kind of relating to, to to you know what's what's in their area as well as they as well as what's what's there. I think in co living buildings in particular, and that's, I think it's been the case a bit with student housing. You have this you can kind of have this issue where you kind of create a ghetto almost where like it's a very insular building and you're creating kind of communities in the building but not necessarily engaging with what's outside. And I'm sure it can probably happen quite a lot with kind of co working. Whereas I think I think it is really important the sort of spaces. You know, you think about ways that spaces can kind of open up to, you know, to the surroundings and to kind of create facilities for local communities so that you're kind of helping to boost boost local economies um, as well. Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm sorry, I've just been told that we need to um, wrap up now, which I'll have to stick with. But Amy, it's been it's been really good talking to you. I mean, I think what's really nice about all of this is the idea that, um, you know, basically, I mean, you were talking about the idea of really not uh, acoustic privacy, but, you know, being quite happy to see people. And I think there's very much that kind of British curtain twitching aspect to it all about where you know, people actually don't mind seeing, but they really don't want to hear things. So, but do you think ultimately, I suppose my final question really, just to wrap up is the idea is, do you think as a result of all of this, we're kind of and working at home that somehow we're societally better neighbours? Um. 
I don't know whether that's necessarily as a result of working from home as maybe just kind of the, the pandemic in general, but I definitely do think we have become better neighbours. Um, and I think one of the kind of one of the questions that comes up so often when you're talking about co-space is this kind of question of privacy. You know, people are really afraid of, you know, giving up their privacy. Um, but in reality, like, you know, you can you can have privacy and also have opportunities to interact with people and like it's when you have both that's when we're just generally healthier and happier in our in our lives oh, well thank you very much amy it's been great talking to you uh thanks for your insights on this um hopefully we'll see how it develops in the next year or so when people do start returning to their co <laughs> Um, all together now, the co-working and co-living revolution by Amy Frearson and Naomi Cleaver is available at Reba Bookshop and you can get a 20% discount if you buy through it. Um, Amy, thank you very much indeed. And um, hopefully we'll, it won't take another five years before we meet again. <laughs> thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Hello and uh, moving on now. Uh, to Ben Hancock, Managing Director at Oscar Acoustics. Um, Hi there. Hello there, Ben. Uh, long time no see. Um, the last time we spoke was probably at one of the um, PIP seminars where a hundred people were sitting in the in the office, in the um, seminar room. I don't think we'll be doing that for a while. It's quite a different um, experience. Yeah, very different. Uh, you were speaking very eruditely, I remember, on a number of topics, not least um, at that time, you were talking about the uh, the uh, amazing kind of acoustic attenuation that you've been spraying all over the Blavatnik Institute in uh, right, yeah. Oxford, um, which had an amazingly compelling kind of like um, warm sponginess to it. I don't know if you're going to be talking about that today. Um, you're talking about agile workspaces focusing on wellness and acoustic comfort. Um, I'm, remind, I'm reminded of that Susan Cain 2012 book, The Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking, um, which is talking about how you harness the power of introverts in the workplace. And uh, while Ben might not be able to provide, prove whether that's the case, I'm sure you'll be able to tell us how to make our work environments more amenable to those who are noise sensitive. So uh, take it away, Ben. Let's give it a go. Here we go. Uh, can you see my screen okay? Yeah. Okay, okay good stuff. Um, so, hi, I'm Ben Hancock, Managing Director of a uh, family-run company in its 43rd year called Oscar Acoustics. Um, we specialise in spray-applied architectural acoustic finishes. So, everything seems to have jammed up, so bear with me. Okay, excellent. A couple of years ago, um, we commissioned the uh, the big Oscar Acoustics Workplace Noise Survey, which gave us some truly fascinating statistics, um, including if you're a uh, male millennial from London, you're around 30% more likely to resort to physical violence in the workplace as a result of excessive noise. That's around 40 times higher than the same person living in East Anglia. Um, a lot has happened in two years though, so we thought we'd do another survey. Uh, called the Big Oscar Acoustics Survey to find out what preparations are being made for the reconfiguration of workspace. Also identifying what potential design challenges architects may face and how easy it will be to adapt to the hybrid workplace of the future. In particular, a focus on the acoustic quality of these reimagined spaces and how uh, this may impact employee welfare, as well as fit out limitations and adhering to new COVID-19 safety measures. It's um, admittedly not the most catchy title. Um, unfortunately, now I'm, uh, I'm unable to present the complete findings as it's still ongoing. We did hope to have them uh, by now, but um, I'll be mixing in to the presentation some interesting initial findings, um, although obviously they could change, but um, so please keep an eye out on my LinkedIn and the Oscar Acoustics YouTube channels uh, for the full and complete results. 
Um, unsurprisingly, JLL um, say that there was a sharp fall last year, and although leasing volumes remain subdued, um, they're seeing promising signs and expect a strong second half of the year. They say that offices will become more social, collaborative and tech enabled to inspire employees and customers to occupy them. Um, there's also a heightened focus on a higher quality core product. Um, according to JLL, the three priorities for employers are uh, define and develop your optimal hybrid working model, um, of course, um, support and shift in working behaviour and uh, create a dynamic office layout, maximising the value of each person's contact whilst accommodating a variety of uses through the day. The new normal is an always on operating model um, that we keep adapting. So how can acoustics help? Most offices are not set up to have multiple people with raised voices on Zoom calls. So naturally, some are going to stay at home because it's easier or so they don't disturb others. Uh, this, can in, uh, this in turn reduces social and therefore collaborative elements. There was a really great piece in The Times a little while ago. Some may call it um, very hot news. Uh, where Tom Whipple interviews British designer Tom Heatherwick, um, Thomas Heatherwick. Uh, he was saying that uh, middle-aged, comfortable people living in their home working suburb bubble um, are getting a touch on the smug side and no longer having to smell the armpits of fellow tube travellers and dropping the kids off at school in their pants. The danger of the smug middle-aged people is that if they think they don't need to come in because uh, they become less relevant, he says, uh, the pulse of organisations will be all about younger people who come together, learn together and push each other. So when talking in an office space, how easy is it? Um, do you have to raise your voice above the sonic battleground around you? It can be exhausting and stressful, just like that summer's day commute on the underground. Um, it's, uh, it's just as bad, if not worse, to be sat amongst it whilst trying to concentrate on something else. In a previous webinar um, I did for Reba on well-being in the workplace, I touched on excessive noise being responsible for many health issues, including uh, diabetes and heart disease, with our Big Oscar workplace noise survey showing that people just weren't aware of these, these risks um, or, or the effects of noise. Um, of course, social distancing is also a concern, but so many offices don't lend themselves to easy reconfiguration due to partition walls surrounded by tile grid ceilings. Um, and here are a few of the initial findings from our survey. So uh, these, this, these went out to architects. So overwhelmingly, the main challenge when reconfiguring workspace is to ensure proper social distancing measures uh, for employees. That's, that's not surprising. Um, fixed partition walls are the main limitation or sticking point to the successful reconfiguration of workspace, uh, meaning that we must find ways of being more flexible with design um, of our space. Overwhelmingly, architects agreed that budgets have stayed the same, uh, despite the increased need for major refits in the wake of the pandemic. So quite interesting so far. I look forward to seeing the, uh, the finished results. Um, in spraying the underside of the concrete slab, rib deck or metal profile, as in this example, um, you're gaining valuable extra height for air circulation, but also that feeling of space. Um, this, is, uh, this is one of our products, Sona Spray FC, sprayed straight onto the, the metal profile um, in grey. Um, so a suspended ceiling would have been around the height of the windows, um, so you would have lost a fair bit of uh, space there. It's also extremely economical and acoustically practical to treat the whole space. Um, depending on the project, we can spray up to 1500 square metres per team. Um, we're currently working on a large office building in Glasgow for Gensler and ISG and had seven teams working at the same time all the way through the building. Um, so there's nothing that can acoustically treat a building faster. Um, the saving is not just in the material rates if you're going for the, the, the more economical 
Sony Spray K13, for instance, um, it's the huge saving in program time as well. Um, time on a building site is extremely expensive. Um, imagine if treating the soffit like the sky and designing your perfect outdoor workspace. A little like this example, this is Sonar Spray K13 in blue. Um, so apart from the outer walls, nothing actually touches the soffit. You might have desks or seating um, in the open, some enclosed seating areas, um, under cover and uh, pod-like structures for meeting rooms or enclosed offices. We're seeing this more often and it really lends itself to complete space flexibility. None of this is interfering with what's above, so, uh, so can be moved or replaced at any time to suit the current needs of the occupier, um, who may need to adapt again and again um, in this fast changing world. Um, the sonar spray is also there untouched and ready for a change of tenant as well. Um, this is another reason we're seeing an increase in the spraying of entire buildings during the CATE fit out. Um, this, uh, this is Sony Spray K13 special, so a bit uh, finer, um, and it's sprayed through the entire building at Gensler's lovely European headquarters in London. Um, Sony Spray also adds to the value of the property by having great environmental credentials. Um, it's made from recycled paper, but it's treated to achieve Class O and B S1 D0 fire rate. Um, and emissions credentials as well. It's M1 classified as a low emitting building material. It's compliant with the California Department of Health. Green Guard Gold certified for indoor air quality. You've got BRIAMS indoor air quality, um, ISO 14025 and towards uh, LEEDS as well. Um, as well as contributing to many of the well building standards sections. Um, I refer back to some useful pre-COVID JLL um, data. Um, green offices are more likely to bring in a rent premium um, and less likely to sit empty. Buildings with BRIAM very good or higher certifications saw a rental premium of 8%. London developments with BRIAM outstanding or excellent ratings experience vacancy rates of just 7% within uh, 24 months of completion. In comparison, those rated very good recorded vacancy rates of 20%. Um, Oscar Acoustics are now ISO 14001 certified as well, which has been very hard work, uh, but well worth the effort. Um, we've had so many people within the company working on this. Um, the first year is always the hardest, I'm told, so uh, there are so many changes that must be made and systems put in place, but it's all been worth it. Um, one of our customers has recently gained an extra five BRIAM points on their project as a result, so that's, that's good. Um, now, one of the project, recent projects uh, that's done everything I've spoken about so well um, is one called Herbal House in London. Um, architects T.P. Bennett are creating this beautiful Manhattan Bluff Star office. Uh, working for contractor BW Workplace Experts, um, Oscar Acoustics applied 16 millimetres of Sonar Spray K13 in mid-grade directly onto the concrete slab throughout the project. You can, you can see it sort of between the concrete beams um, amongst all the services, sort of quietly doing its job blending into the surroundings there. Um, uh, so I'd, I'd like to thank BW actually for kindly allowing us to use their photos um, and also credit Tom Green Photography as well, that the photos, I, I think the photos are amazing. Um, central to achieving their goal of creating a tranquil office um, ambiance was the issue of noise reverberation. It was imperative that uh, workers could communicate easily without needing to shout and that staff could work harmoniously without distractions. The client needed to allow for agile ways of working, providing flexible environments um, that offer focused work zones, um, co-working spaces and relaxed breakout areas. Uh, a combination of both impromptu and formal meeting rooms were also required. 
uh, a library was also installed to provide a useful resource and, and social hub. One of my favourite spaces actually on the project. Um, it's a stunning building and one uh, worth looking into more if you get a chance. Um, there's been some great articles um, written on it. It's, uh, it's great and there's a lot more images online as well. Um, now it's easy to forget that uh, that actually we do a range of five finishes. So the product you saw there was the coarsest finish, Sona Spray K13. Um, but this this finish you see now is K13 Special, uh, which is tighter in texture. Um, and Sona Spray FC, which is the finest non-troud finish in in the Sona Spray range. You see that um, up on the on the soffit. I think we sprayed directly onto concrete there. Um, Sony Spray FCX is sprayed and troweled to give a beautifully versatile flat and pitted surface um, like a, a pre-coloured render and often appearing as plaster when used with downlights. Uh, being a spray only finish and, and troweled but no baseboard, it's, it's extremely uh, versatile in that you can, you can just create these incredible shapes. Um, we went straight on to the GRG in this photo and um, I, it, it really does look great. And um, that's Hyde uh, restaurant in London, if ever anyone fancies some amazing food as well. Um, Oscar Elite completes the range and is the smoothest acoustic plaster on the market, um, appearing smoother than painted conventional uh, plaster. Um, so we do projects of all shapes and sizes, and not just huge offices. Um, now, I thought I'd end the presentation with a few of the most common frequently asked questions. Um, we do get asked these a lot. So um, the first, can it be repaired? Um, yes. Um, so the Sony Spray K13 I showed you earlier, I could, if, if a scaffolder, because um, they do, if they were to knock, say for instance, a tennis ball size chunk um, out of the finish, um, I could repair that invisibly within around about a minute. And it's so easy to repair. We, we quite often actually train one of the, uh, the main contractors laborers to do repairs. So they don't always have to call us back if they don't uh, want to. Um, how does the sonar spray finish into an intumescent steel beams? Um, so we spray up to the steel, um, neatly edge the material and then lever it away in a, in a V shape. Um, the sonar spray is superb in a fire. So levering it away allows the flame to get to the intumescent so that it can do its job. Um, in practice, this is what it looks like um, in the, uh, the Gensler office. Um, you can see the sonar spray going up to the black steel work. And then if we uh, zoom in on that, um, you've just got that kind of slightly veed, or less sharp than that, slightly beveled edge. That's great. Um, can you overspray untidy cementitious fire spray? Um, yes, you can. Um, in fact, the sonar spray is the only acoustic system to have been assessed by UL, the US testing body, as suitable for use onto a cementitious fire spray. Um, so it's, it's pre-coloured, so it decorates, acoustically treats, and just tidies the whole place up in one go. Um, so yeah, ideal for for refreshing a, a project. Um, I've been told I need a class A absorber. Does your material achieve this? Um, yes, it does. Uh, excuse the, the whiteboard sketches here. Um, yes, so um, that would be 30 millimetres of acoustic finish. Um, but uh, you don't necessarily need that. So when the sound is hitting a bare surface, the sound just bounces straight off. Uh, sometimes in getting deflected in different directions, but the noise level sort of remains the same. Now, when applying our finishes onto them, a strange thing happens. You see the direction of the sound in, in some directions. Um, generally, the thicker you spray, the higher the low frequency. If we were to spray a thinner Class C equivalent spray depth, something like, I don't know, 16, 20 millimetres, um, onto a profile, in areas the spray depth is actually much thicker. You see where the sound is hitting it at an angle. Um, combine this with a larger developed area and you can actually really reduce the spray depth considerably. Um, so that saves time and also materials, so, uh, so money. 
Um, you're also benefiting from the air gap behind the deck to absorb more low frequency sound. So I need to uh, start calling you to order on that one now. That's fine. Last couple of slides. Um, so on uh, hollow rip, uh, a different thing happens. You get benefit from the extra spray depth in the ribs, increasing low frequency absorption and therefore reducing the material depth required to achieve the performance. Um, and the last image you see from Oscar Acoustics isn't going to be my terrible drawings. Um, here is one last pretty photo um, of our acoustic plasterers at the Four Seasons Trinity Square London. Um, acoustic consultants on the project Clark Saunders said that uh, the acoustics moved the jazz band to tears on the opening night. Um, they said that they'd never heard themselves sound so good. Mm. So quite a nice compliment. Uh, thank you all very much. Um, Please, nice one, yeah, do follow us on the social media and then you'll see the uh, the results for the survey on there as well. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. That was great. Some really nice examples there, some lovely projects. Um, highly tactile stuff, though. Um, I was just wondering about how much, I mean, my only question is, you know, where would you recommend it being touchable and where would you recommend it being out of touch? That would be my question. Okay. Um, any acoustic finish, uh, even if it's a hard uh, finish um, to touch anyway, I would recommend being above head height. Um, right. The reason being was our sonar spray finishes um, are very, they can really take an impact. You could throw a basketball at them all day. Um, or, but the, the acoustic plaster finishes tend to, whilst they feel hard to touch, they've got a soft backing behind them. So what you get is like an eggshell effect it's hard to touch, but you can you can break that eggshell very, very easily. Um, so whilst we're able to repair ours, um, a, a lot of them end up, um, so, uh, a lot of the ones on the market are, are very difficult to repair and you end up, it's a bit like repairing some render or whatever, you tend to see that. Um, but uh, yeah, above head height if you can. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you very much indeed, Ben. Thanks for your um, showing us the uh, projects you've been working on. Some really nice stuff. Um, we need to move on. Thank you very much. Uh, we need to move on to uh, Joshua Ray now, Senior and, and Project Architect at Architecture PLB. Uh, Joshua joined Architecture PLB in 2015 and has led a range of projects across education, residential and commercial sectors. Uh, he's going to be talking to us about the new Promega UK headquarters in Southampton, which was shortlisted for Reba Regional Award. Uh, this headquarters completed on 20, in 2019 at the University of Southampton Science Park. Uh, they were asked by the client to produce a home from home atmosphere with excellent natural light, connection to nature and a variety of spaces in which to work. When I first saw this building, I thought it looked like a really glamorous Chamonix ski chalet. And I was actually very surprised to find out that it wasn't. It wasn't only not a, a, a vast home, but it was an office and had a laboratory too. So uh, to enlighten us about it, um, Josh, if you could take it away, thank you. Hello, good morning. Morning, everyone. Okay, I'll just start my screen share. Um, uh, uh, so, Josh, I'll probably be calling you to order there about six minutes past ten. Is that okay? That's fine. Yeah, I, I can I can work with that. Okay. So, um, morning, everyone. Uh, just starting off with a kind of slightly cryptic image of, of perhaps where we end up with the form. So, uh, we were first um, involved in this as a bid scheme in 2016. So, actually, uh, five years almost to the day. Um, and this image is a sort of lovely image of the site. You can see sort of lots of opportunity for amazing views. Uh, it's got this lovely kind of natural meadow feel. Uh, and then to the left is a, a grass bund, which actually shields the M27 motorway partially from the site. So um, the, a little bit about Promega, um, sorry to jump around, so a little bit about Promega before we go any further. They are a small pharmaceutical company in sort of world terms. Um, they're based around the world and the portion we were dealing with was the UK branch, which operate um, largely independently. Um, and they've been renting a building for 25 years on the science park. So literally sort of a five minute walk up the up the road from where we were looking at a site. So the site itself is this kind of um, whale shape, um, pink blob, and then a car park associated with that on a 
science park, um, which is also which is located on sort of lovely manor manor house grounds with sort of arboretums and, and walled gardens and things like that. And then to the left hand side of the site is a small farm collection of farm buildings. And then the big zigzag red line is the motorway and the kind of particular noise constraint we were we're looking at with the site. Um, the site had outline application for a, a, a sort of identical um, retail park kind of classic office spec office building, um, but the client was looking to do something different to that. Um, so we had a, a really great kind of brief um, from the client for the um, bid scheme um, in terms of what they wanted, not only sort of spatially, but also um, aspirationally in terms of their the way of working. Lots of crossover, what we've just been hearing from Amy and um, from Ben on the acoustic side of things. So lots of acoustic stuff kind of came into play in, within the scheme, but also this kind of crossover, different ways of working, lots of flexibility um, and creating this, as, as it sort of says in the blurb really about the project, this home away from home um, feeling. They they, um, they pride themselves in, in really holding on to employees and being a, a company that is um, has that kind of uh, softer touch. So yeah, by no means a spec office. This is a very much a bespoke building for this client. Um, so for the bid scheme, we kind of came up with this approach, which was a, a walled garden sort of sunken into the existing site levels um, with an office element floating over the top. So that kind of office area with meeting rooms off the side and kind of um, flexible office space and then some of the other functions, which include some storage and distribution aspects and some laboratories um, located sort of within the site itself and sort of sunken down. Um, so great projects or, you know, have kind of great clients and uh, it's sort of cliche thing to say, but they, the client was, was passionate about this from the very outset. Uh, and very, very invested in 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 what we were going to produce aesthetically from the external, but also the function of the internal spaces, um, and really sort of drove us hard to come up with a with a great scheme, and to really interrogate all the different options available to us. Um, and part of that process was taking us to the U.S. branch in America, where they have a, a campus of buildings, and they have an architect they work very closely with on all of that. So. Um, all of those people were involved in in this sort of session, week long workshop in America, looking at all their buildings there, sort of really sort of nailing down their ethos as a company and making sure that we what we delivered was 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 for them. Um, so our sort of massing response looked at the functions uh, of, of, that they needed to provide, and there was this clear kind of um, uh, kind of difficulty in that the storage and sort of laboratory function had a, a, a much sort of different massing to an office and didn't sit well beneath um, as, with the floor to floor height. So we separated those two wings, the shape responded to the, the site um, site form, um, creating these aspects from the brief, like the, the um, secluded kind of courtyard garden space kind of privacy. And then we floated an office space over the top and uh, play played with the roof form and to bring in natural light into certain spaces and to create more intimate spaces where the roof dropped down. Uh, and that itself kind of resulted in uh, these kind of key moves at ground floor where you've got this, where the, where the number one is this kind of formal kind of welcoming public facing space where they would welcome in clients or um, universities or, or um, teaching groups. Um, number two is where this sort of laboratory um, storage function of the um, company is, and then number three is the staff amenity spaces, and they really have a you know a real focus on uh, on what they give their staff in terms of amenity, um, and it's uh, it kind of plays a real key part in the what, what kind of makes an exceptional building for the staff to work in, and then at um, the first floor we've got uh, a sort of double height space for that formal entrance space. Number four is your your flexible office space. Um, the building they were in for 25 years had was a was a much similar size, um, but all the desks got pushed to the edge, and they had all these kind of uh, conflicting teams within the office. So the sales team were particularly loud on the phones, and other teams that were sort of technical support and were much sort of quieter, and and accounting were much quieter. So they had all these sort of um, about 25 to 30 staff in groups of four to six. And they were all sort of pushed to the edges and their their ambition early on was to get people away from a window one to lose that ownership of a view ownership of a window uh, but also to bring the company together because it had kind of been pushing itself away from, from from each other if, if that makes sense 
Um, and in order to do that, to make that work, the these kind of flexible breakout spaces where the number six, the kind of pink color is shown, really important to have sort of quiet acoustic booths, um, HR offices where there's some privacy, um, small to medium meeting rooms. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, that's kind of where we end up with the design. Um, and then, as I said, the client was very, very invested the whole way through the process. They had a huge sort of appetite and um, enthusiasm and energy to keep going and keep really nailing down all the materials. And we, this is the sort of part of our interior pro process in terms of looking at what the internal spaces would be like, how we would treat them acoustically, how we would create a hierarchy of color and, and feel. And um, this sort of led to us having a kind of template of the more formal front of house spaces having, um, having a kind of, kind of calmer, neutral tones, and then a bit more fun with color in the back of house spaces. And then in terms of the building aesthetic, um, part of the trip to America kind of led us to feel that we would create a building for Promega that had that ethos of, of natural materials, of self-finished materials, um, but they wanted it to feel very much you know, modern and very much in, in kind of keeping with um, UK aesthetics rather than looking like one of the American buildings planted in, planted in the UK, if that makes sense. Uh, and this is, yeah, this is that, that piece on the interiors and the kind of hierarchy of, of how we create a material palette to use in those spaces. And some yellows and slightly more fun colours in the back, some of the back of house private kind of staff amenity spaces. So how did that look? Eventually we had this, this sort of largely glazed entrance space. They were very keen to create a kind of open welcoming um, entrance area. Um, and then this sort of floating zinc box over the top of that. Um, and this the sort of um, concept for the materials was a, an external garden wall in the, the um, coarse stone and then on the internal courtyard was a more sort of formal brick facing courtyard space with colonnade um, to create a kind of semi-private uh, staff uh, area amenity space. We worked with Exia Callahan on the structures so it's sort of every type of construction you can imagine really on this we've got load bearing block work with a CLT roof we've got portal frame timber which we'll see shortly We've got this sort of amazing uh, timber roof designed by EOC with sort of 20 meter laminated um, laminated beams and some steel frame where the, where the beams could not be used externally. So there's a whole kind of hybrid of structures and then lots of in situ concrete to give us our thermal mass for our uh, environmental strategy. It's going to cut through of the single story wing on the right hand side with a green roof. Uh, we're very keen to get that green roof in to kind of restore the, the meadow that was was there when we first found the site. And then on the left hand side is the, the office space with a raised floor uh, that has a kind of um, that acts as a plenum for the cooling and um, cooling for the space. And then how did that work out in delivery? So the, the portal fray, as you can see, was sort of this, this for this for the storage wings, big spans, allowing ultimate flexibility of that space with um, some visible connections on some of the beams. Uh, kind of amazing how quickly these things go up. So it went up in a day and a half. Um, and then this is the main roof going up again with these lovely invisible connections. You know, this, this kind of kind of wow moment of realizing some of the volumes and spaces we'd we'd created and Exio Callahan working, you know, amazingly with the subcontractors to deliver some of these um, five points of connection and the beam in the middle going north has got a V, a concave V, and the beams to the right and the left have a convex v, v profile to take the CLT beam. So the kind of wonders of modern manufacturing in terms of all those being pre-machined um, pre before coming to site. And the screws that connect things together, I think we're about 400 mil long, so it's quite, all quite amazing. And this is the client standing there kind of realizing what, they'd, what they're gonna have in the end. The green roof, was done by Bowder, absolutely beautiful when it when it first went in and it's gone through sort of phases of life. At the moment, it's got some lovely flowers on it. It, it kind of it dries and dies and comes back and it's it's actually, it's kind of amazing um, the kind of phases of life it goes through. And this moment of all this pink flower was just, um, I think they thought they were going to have this forever, but um, yeah. Uh, and then a bit more about the kind of um, welcoming space. So we, we um, <clears throat> they really felt they wanted this to be kind of open open arms and welcoming um, to clients. But there's on the right hand side, we've gone for the sort of close centers on the curtain walling to give some privacy to some of the spaces. 
this is the single story element with the green roof on top. So you can just about see some sprigs of, um, of wildflowers sticking up over the top of that. Um, everywhere we were trying to bring in light into the, the clear story glazing and into the warehouse space. And I mean, I wish I had the photo from yesterday when we were on site because the, the gardens are absolutely, you know, at their, their perfect best. Um, this is sort of early stages on the um, landscaping. So it's, you know, year one and it looks incredible. Um, and a bit more of the view from the sort of the neighboring neighboring part of the site and the, to the left is a kind of little yoga garden. So again, the, the client really focused on this sort of staff experience, the well-being of the staff. And they really pride themselves in staff retention and attracting you know, good, good employees. And it's not, you know, with the all the change at the moment in the working life and people working from home, um, to have a workplace that people want to be in is a, it's an asset to the client. Um, and it's yeah, it's 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 working well for them, albeit at the moment. Um, home working, home working is um, yeah, at the moment home working is is sort of more their their trend at the moment. But they they will be um, will be having people back in. So on the left is a um, the feature staircase they commissioned working with Nolte Bespoke on the light fitting, uh, and and. As you can see, sort of acoustic cladding everywhere we can get it, and uh, the ceilings between the beams have got uh, Rock Von Mono products between them, um, which um, really quite efficiently acoustically attenuates all the spaces. So where you've got hard finishes like concrete and polished concrete and and, and uh, lots of glazing, the Rock Von Mono does an incredible job at sort of tempering the tempering the noise within all the spaces. This is one of their home away from home spaces. So this is a staff kitchen amenity facility they are able to use at any point in the day. There are lots of them come down there and work throughout the day. They want a quiet corner to sit and work with their laptop. This is a, the boardroom space where they would sort of uh, entertain clients and have kind of formal meetings. However, with a view to flexibility, the floor is a magnetic, um, a T-row flooring product that can come up and it's a raised floor. So they could easily move to carpet here and and convert this space to office should they need to in the future. Uh, and again, with all this, you know, talk about kind of acoustics and how do office spaces work efficiently. One of the problems with their previous space was the kitchen space was just a corner off the side of their office and it was a, a noise issue. So we put lots of sort of these breakout T, T points away from the main office space to enable people to have kind of um, small informal meetings or to go and have their, their little coffee break. And they really want people to get away from their desk for that, that coffee thing. Main office space, which is, I guess, the main point of the scheme. All the desks away from the windows. Lots of flexibility in terms of the raised floor and floor boxes being able to you know, be wherever you want them to be. Um, and then the kind of um, diffusers in the floor to, to um, the create a kind of cool cooling system within the building. Um, again, they are flexible. So the whole thing is flexible if anyone wanted to move. And one of the key kind of client inputs into the early part of the design was to create what they call white space within the design so that at the moment, this is probably quite, quite. Uh, I call it baggy for an office space where you could easily have the desks closer together, um, which is obviously a benefit with with current um, current issues in the office space. Uh, a little wood wall acoustic product in this this um, Skype room they call it, um, and a very efficient kind of uh, acoustic glazed folding screen. So that that room's great for private meetings, and then a little bit on the you know coordination of services and getting these spaces looking beautiful, albeit functional. And that's a little bit on the team, the team that evolved and some of the products we used. And I think that's me done. So I don't know if people want to ask any questions. Well, I'm, I'm, thank you very much indeed, Josh. That was great. Um, I'm kind of interested really personally in the, uh, uh, you, you may have mentioned it and I've missed it, but I was just interested in what your ventilation, because Promega, do they work in tech? Sorry, they're a pharmaceutical um, yeah. pharmaceutical company, and they do. I mean, the business that we were, that we're working with, they're largely sort of telesales and tech support of their product, and then they do have the the distribution function within, and then they have the labs they have within the building are sort of teaching and demonstration labs rather than yeah. research. Oh right, yeah, because I was yeah. I was interested really in what your ventilation strategy was there, because it looked like it would be a dead ring of being able to be like purely purely um, passively ventilated. And I was just wondering what you, how you kind of dealt with all of that. Yeah, so um, we worked with Hawley on the m and &E strategy. Um, and we, in terms of the overall building strategy for, for um, the environmental approach, um, we didn't need to have opening windows. 
Um, so in the main office space, we do have cross ventilation that's available. Um, where it's an issue on the site is acoustically. So because you've got the motorway to the south, I think to rely solely on cross ventilation there would have been a problem. It's really, you know, on certain days, especially in the winter when there's no trees, it's, it's white noise. It's like a quite a distinct white noise sound. Um, so the client kept, has the, does use the cross ventilation. They had them open yesterday when we were there. Uh, but it certainly um, doesn't need it. So the ventilation system is a, a plenum below the raised floor that has a, um, a low energy uh, lake of cool air that gradually tempers the space. So it's a low energy solution. Um, and then the scheme itself has all sorts of, of low energy um, aspects, it's got ground source heat pumps. Oh, yeah. um, and then they're also, for future thinking, they've got some solar trees that will be in the car park space that will be um, assisting in terms of their um, energy output. So sustainability, sustainability was really kind of like one of your core aspects when you were designing this, clearly. It, it was, yeah, and and that, you know, obviously I want as an architect, I wanted to use the um, the in situ concrete. It's something I, I've sort of had a kind of itch I wanted to do before, but but actually we didn't arrive at that until we had a strategy where it said, you know, thermal mass, yeah, you know, exposed thermal mass was going to be a real benefit to keeping the building cool. Um, and we came up with a because of the client specific needs and these sort of this sort of um, conflicting needs of having a storage facility with lots of fridges in. Um, I mean, you, you would have heard about it with COVID, the minus 70 fridges, the minus 20s, yeah. so sort of fridges and freezers. So they have that kind of that function, which which really conflicts with achieving certain environmental standards. So rather than badging it and saying we're Briam or or we're doing lead or anything else like that on the project. We came up with a, what was called a sustainability charter with Hawley, and it was a document that pulled together loads of aspirations uh, that we could benchmark the project against, um, and the you know well above building reg standards in terms of insulation and, and air tightness. Um, so yeah, it doesn't have a you can't label it, but it's a, a high performing uh, building, albeit you know with a lot of glass. So yeah, we're doing a lot to try and try and counter that. Okay. Uh, just a question from the floor here from the one of our, our viewers saying, did you work with Nulty on lighting design or on the fittings of the reception? What was, how much was yeah, that so, part of it? Yeah, so, the, so the, the interior package, we, we designed uh, an interior approach and like, like I say, we had the workshops with the client and working out that kind of hierarchy. Um, they then appointed a sorry, client design advisor with Perkins and Will to kind of help them nail down and select some of their internal bits and pieces, largely furniture, and then some of the sort of fabrics and, and, and carpets and things like that. Um, and then uh, in terms of fittings, uh, Perkins and Will worked with Nulti to come up with a concept for a, a, a feature light within that space. So yeah, and Nulti, and then Nulti then worked with us to sort of deliver it on site. So yeah, we kind of, it's a yeah, big team approach. Okay, and just one more question I'll, 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 I'll put to you saying, thank you for your enlightening presentation. Was there consideration to make interior spaces adaptive over time, large, like large movable walls to embrace views and the in indoor-outdoor relationship in at summer equinox? The laminated structure seems to be suggestive of this. The, the interior spaces, yeah, the, low, the walls themselves, one or two of them are cross bracing, so they can't, can't be moved, but generally it's, it's sort of total flexibility internally. So whilst they have some cellular offices on the southern end at the moment, they may move away from that and they could actually kind of enlarge that space. Um, and yes, yeah, so largely, particularly at first floor, it's very flexible. Um, on the ground floor with the in situ concrete, it's, it's less so. It's, it's the thermal mass in that approach, it's more um, fixed. It's what we have there. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed. It looks like a great building. I mean, you said you were there yesterday, were you? Yes, is it was, yeah. At full capacity or is it? No, so they, they've they always been a, a company that allows staff to work from home, um, but they are about, about between five and 10 people there at the moment, sadly. Um, but they, they will be moving to a, a partial working week uh, when they can. Um, and I think, as I, as I mentioned, with the home and away from home feeling, they they have a, a touchy feely approach with their employees. It's very much focused on well being, um, and uh, and and yeah, staff experience. And so uh, they're they're certainly not going to be forcing people back in or saying you know we're all back in. Um, but it it certainly suits that you know acoustically, as I mentioned with the the some of the products in there and lots of the acoustic treatments. You could all be having Zoom calls from in there. It would be okay. Um, so. 
it certainly sort of met that part of the brief. Um, but yeah, at the moment, there, it's quite quiet in there. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, it, lo it looks like a great space. It really does look like an enjoyable place to be. Like I said, it feels very, it really does not feel like an office at all. It really feels like a kind of a a luxury private home really there's certainly aspects of it that's right yeah i didn't show half the photos there's they've got some lovely uh, you know, lovely bathrooms and some shower yeah. rooms and a gym and things like that there so that it's really quite special in some of the, some of the parts of the scheme yeah well congratulations on that thank you very much indeed for presenting it to us thank you um we need to move on now to uh one of, another one of our sponsor presentations uh this is by 3m and they'll be telling us about the Hilton Hotel in Watford, which uses their Dynock architectural finishes to refurbish tired, and from what I can see, you know, I really mean tired, washrooms. Um, strange idea, the use of veneers, probably not anything that Adolf Luce would approve on, but then he wasn't really being faced with climate disasters and the need to eliminate landfill. Um, Jack Halewood is going to be speaking to us, Applications Engineer at 3M. He's been an expert on the Dynock architectural finish. Um, and Jack, you there? I am, Carlos. Thank you very Hello. much for the introduction. Thank you very much for your time. Oh, thank you and good morning, everyone. I'm yeah, delighted to be on the call this morning and to get the opportunity to present as Carlos says, you know, the 3M Dynock architectural finishes range, which yeah, again, you know, conformable, conformable uh, covering that's, you know, being used across, you know, the office fit out sector, both on, you know, new builds um, to replace, you know, as an alternative to tra traditional solutions and materials, and also in, you know, refurbishment projects um, and the Hilton case study that I'm, you know, going to go through this morning is an ex excellent example of this. So I think the best way to present this is really, you know, give the, the client the voice. So I'm going to play a video um, to start the presentation, um, which we'll delve into to now just to give you an idea, you know, those restrooms, what they look like and, you know, how they were transformed using, you know, our Dy Dynock range. So if we can ju jump into the video, that'll be fantastic. Um, so yeah, this this will show you, you know, the Hilton Watford headquarters, um, and as I said, those those restrooms and what they look like, you know, before um, the refurbishment using, you know, our um, architecture finishes solution. So hopefully that video will start coming through for you. Um, I'll just give it a couple of seconds. Any issues with that? Then if we can't see that, I'll just jump directly into my slides. So. Is that video coming through yet? Hello, my name is Eli Antoniudaki. I'm part of CAPEX team of architecture, design, and construction team here in Hilton Worldwide. So the first time I was exposed uh, with film, uh, film was uh, uh, during the renovation one of our hotels in Barcelona, where uh, the interior designers had specified film film to cover um, existing public areas. So um, although initially I was, I was a little bit reluctant. Um, of using a cover uh, of existing design elements, actually I was truly impressed by the final result. So following this uh, collaboration helped us renovating our offices here in Watford and specifically our quite tired uh, restrooms. Using 3M Dynac uh, on existing furniture and fittings um, really basically eliminated um, the need uh, to move waste uh, to landfill. Yeah, so we, over, we oversaw the bathroom project. Um, obviously, the concept of wrapping the doors was uh, was a new thing to me. I haven't seen it before. Uh, in terms of the finished article, very impressive. Uh, Durability-wise, I'd say absolutely amazing. The team were very professional. A very good experience in terms of working working with the, the, the team that did it. I'll definitely look at it, look at it for future innovations and projects. Yes.
Fantastic. So, yeah, glad to have been able to share that video with you. And I just want to um, delve into a little bit more detail. And I think it's illustrated quite well from the stakeholders involved in the video, um, you know, why the Hilton opted to use, you know, 3M Dynoc rather than, you know, other solutions, whether that was to repaint or um, rip out the um, doors and start again. And again, Alia in the video touches upon, you know, I'll talk you through the different elements to that. Um, one of the reasons Hilton, you know, opted to use Dynoc and they sit, saw that, you know, it fitted in with their strategy around um, reducing landfill, you know, to have a quite aggressive targets, uh, reducing that by up to, you know, 50% by 2030. So rather than, you know, ripping out the existing restrooms um, doors, they utilize, you know, Dynox to recover and revitalize them um, and then extending the life, you know, of those doors by up to 12 years. Um, you know, the, the other factor in that, you know, the choice of and the specification of Dynox in that scenario was, you know, both the, you know, how functional it is and, you know, in the workability of it. So, you know, when they chose Dynoc, they wanted to ensure that, you know, they could cover, you know, the whole, the whole door. So Dynoc is conformable. It can, you know, go around the corners of the door. And then also, you know, they wanted from, you know, an aesthetic perspective, it'd be difficult to differentiate, you know, Dynoc versus, you know, a real wood. And, you know, with our materials and the, you know, the installers who, who fit them on our behalf, they use techniques to, you know, to hide the joints. So from a visual perspective, you're un unable to see any joints in the material. And essentially they should replicate um, from an aesthetic perspective, you know, the finish that you would, would choose. Um, and from a finishes perspective, you know, we have an incredibly wide and extensive range you know, with a heavy focus on, you know, the latest design trends. And again, for the Hilton, um, they were looking for a material that would fit into the, you know, the scheme of their, you know, what what Wofford head office. Um, and just with the range being so extensive, they were able to identify, you know, finish. Um, and we, we supply, you know, samples to, for them to, you know, look at and ensure that, you know, it fits with what they wanted. Um, so hence, again, you know, one of the rationale for using, you know, architectural finishes. Um, and then from a reliability perspective, you know, the range is manufactured in Japan. Um, you know, over in Japan, it's a, you know, $100 million market for 3M. And it's something that, you know, is extensively used over there. Um, and, you know, one of the things for the Hilton tied into the reliability aspect of it was the durability side. You know, they were really conscious in, you know, a high traffic environment that a head office is and certainly a restroom. They wanted something that, you know, essentially they could trust to, you know, stand up to that um, traffic. And one of the reference points they use when selecting the materials that, you know, we we refurbished in 2009, um, the fire doors in the Hilton Miami. Um, and, you know, we have extensive pictures and data behind, you know, they are still in situ at the moment. Um, and, you know, they, they were very confident in terms of, you know, how this would stand the test of time in that head office environment. Um, you know, other, other factors that played a part in the material choice was, you know, the both the cost performance. So, you know, certainly, you know, cost was a consideration for them um, and, you know, choosing, you know, an architectural finish over, you know, replacing brand new. Clearly there was benefits uh, for them and then also efficiencies, um, you know, having to rip them out, put them into landfill, start again, um, you know, from a Dynoc application perspective, they view that as a, you know, a quicker, um, you know, obviously dust free, um, an easier application for them to achieve um, when when selecting the material over, you know, other solutions. And the final part, certainly, you know, in the office environment today and, you know, as we come out of this pandemic, um, you know, the, the Dynoc range is, you know, a non-porous solution. So it does have that, you know, easy, clean features and benefits that, you know, people, you know, is very important in, in today's environment. So we have extensive data around, you know, what disinfectants um, you can use to ensure that, you know, you have a safe environment as we welcome employees back into to the offices um, using our Dynoc solution.
Um, so that is, you know, really, you know, the top top points around, you know, the selection of Dianoc in, you know, that example that we've shared with you today. Um, and in terms of just a little bit more details in the range, as I've touched upon in terms of that selection from, you know, the Hilton choosing that fine wood, the range is incredibly broad. Um, you know, it looks to um, tie into, you know, the traditional solutions out there, the likes of stone, you know, your mortars, your concrete, your woods but also identify new trends. Um, and we have over a thousand different um, patterns available um, to the market. So really, you know, inspiring, you know, creation of typically, you know, in areas maybe where you can't use those traditional materials, Dynoc, you know, offers that as a vi viable alternative. Um, and within the range, you know, we, we're trying to enhance, you know, bring, functional films to the market um, and what i mean by functional um is one of the you know the latest films that we launched back in 2019 and the you know the voc and the voice of customer that we had from you know both you know the design community was you know they want to achieve that um ultra matte look uh, very on trend but one of the you know pain points that they encountered was with that type of finish, you know, a lot of fingerprints, you know, dirt was um, typical, um, you know, when using that in particular environments. So what we developed was, you know, an ultramat um, Dynoc finish, but with free um, m painted technology on the t on a, a top coat, uh, which effectively acts as, you know, anti anti fingerprint, anti dirt, and is something that we've um, you know, is being used extensively. And the also benefit of this um, anti-fingerprint technology is it allows us to create um, a heavier grain in the woods and the dry woods that we produce. Again, creating that, you know, tactile finish, um, you know, when customers are using Dynoc, you know, aesthetically, they want it to, you know, replicate the, you know, the traditional materials that they, the double wise use. So it's really important to have that, you know, tactile and then all other functional elements around, you know, easy clean, anti-fingerprint um, factors. So yeah, another part of, you know, what we continue to develop and how we expand this Dynoc range. Um, other, you know, frequently asked questions, if you like, in terms of, you know, 3M ourselves with the manufacturer of the film, but we have a, you know, extensive, um, what we call the endorse network, you know, they tr they're trained to, you know, maximize the use of our material to ensure that, you know, the end user gets the final finish that they want. Um, and then from a testing perspective, um, we have, you know, the EN13501 from a fire test perspective, uh, less less relevant in, you know, the office sector, but we do have the IMO standard for Marine. And then also um, we have, you know, the, the part of the lead credit scheme. Um, and, you know, if you want to learn more and, you know, get in a bit more detail of this range and what potentially it could offer you on future projects, we do offer um, monthly CPDs, uh, which at the moment are, you know, via the virtual platforms. Um, so that that was it from myself. Um, I really appreciate everyone's time this morning. And if there are any questions, clearly I'll be happy to take them. Thanks a lot, Jack. Um, interesting presentation. Good video, actually. I think for, you know, showing very clearly, you know, the the existing conditions and and how they've been changed as a result of the application of your. Um, of the Dynoc um, finish. Uh, for me personally, I'm kind of interested in, in, I mean, one's always kind of slightly, uh, could be dubious about adhesive finishes because you kind of wonder what's the longevity of them? What's their working life? And as you say, these are high traffic environments. They're going to be used, you know, they're going to be used by a lot of people. I'm interested really in what the cleaning regimes for these are and how, how tested they are in terms of, because obviously now we're more and more obsessed with the idea of clean, cleaning things multiple times a day. So how does the finish actually deal with kind of long-term maintenance issues in high traffic areas? So one, one of the key features for us, Carlos, on in terms of the Dynoc range is, you know, the durability aspects to it. As you say, it's developed for, you know, commercial environments. Um, I think the key, you know, the key factors of this is that it is a 12 year product uh, used extensively in the Japanese and Italian market. So we have, you know, quite broad data points in terms of, you know, the applications. So I think a reference one there in terms of, you know, the Hilton Miami 
um, which is a case study that I can share out. And that was an application in 2009. And Hilton, you know, as an external, you know, um, person to point to, you know, they, they have tested it and um, they show, you know, how it's still, you know, in situ today. So, you know, again, high traffic use on a fire door. Um, so from a cleaning regime, you know, 3M is, you know, one of the big manufacturers within, you know, the cleaning side. We have products, a broad product portfolio in that space. We've done extensive testing in terms of, um, which again, I can share out and it is in our product bulletins. So we can stand up to, you know, a, a wide range of different disinfectants and, you know, that, that is repeated exposure to those. So, you know, within you know office or hospitality environments that is it what it's withstand it what it's designed to withstand yeah but i mean it's, it's it's solvents as well as disinfectants isn't it which would be probably more of an issue if you're talking about adhesion um i'm interested as well in the in the flammability of the surfaces it's applied to does it does it change the properties of the final surface that it's applied to i mean you mentioned here in miami it's been used on a fire door so i'm assuming not no, it doesn't. No, we, we as I say, can, um, there's, there are different constructions that we have different um, within the pattern group. There are different constructions to the film, but we have, um, you know, the as I say, the EEN standard that is available uh, online, again, that I can share out, but it doesn't change the, you know, the fire performance of the substrate that it's applied to. Okay, great. Um, we have a question from Conway here that says, uh, concern that the state of the substrate would be a state of the substrate would be a concern. How does it handle humidity levels? In the Pacific Islands where I am based, Lucky Conway, uh, it would be a concern. <laughs> However, I like the concept providing a finished solution to existing components. How does it deal with issues of humidity then? So in terms of humidity, um, it, it's broadly used in, you know, it can be used in, um, humid environment so as long as it's applied um correctly it, it wouldn't wouldn't be issue in terms of the question around substrate you know it's really important and it's part of you know the endorsed network in terms of the training you know th those substrates have to be pr um prepared correctly um you know th this is a film so any um you know bumps or in that substrate will show through but that is part of the you know the uh, training that our endorsed installers go through well thank you very much indeed jack um seems very prescient considering we spent the last 15 months masking up that you're giving us a product which actually allows you to mask existing ones so um thank you for the prescience of that presentation thank you carlos <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we need to move on now to uh, our next building presentation, which comes from Ronnie Graham, partner at Rider Architecture, who will be talking about their Tombola house building in Sunderland, which the RIBA journal actually ran last year. Isabel Priest went up to take a look at it and was quite impressed, and she's hard to impress. Um, really enjoyed the space. Um, large internal spaces like atrium space and what i remember absolutely roof light a go-go which i was saying to ronnie when we when we opened uh started the presentation that uh, obviously sunderland needs that kind of level of light obviously uh but to tell us about it ronnie um yep good uh, morning everyone i'm morning carlos good morning. um yeah um i'll just share my uh screen We'll get straight on to the presentation. Can you guys see that? Let's try that again. Yeah, yeah, can see that. Okay. So we'll just go straight in. So, um, yep. I'm Ronnie Graham here to present the uh, Tombola case study. Um, so just a little bit on um, on Ryder itself. We're established in Newcastle in 1953 and we're based in uh, five UK cities. Uh, in addition, we've got um, studios in Hong Kong, Vancouver and Amsterdam. So our, our goal is simple really. Um, it's 
uh, to improve the quality of the world around us and in doing so improve people's lives. So we've got a little bar chart there just showing some of the spread of our current workload and um, 538 live projects and uh, we're a business of uh, 24 million turnover. So a little bit about the project um, Tombola House, the client Tombola, they're um, based in Sunderland, founded in Sunderland and um, are operating in five European countries. The building itself is around 25,000 square foot. Um, we've got a net to gross efficiency on the upper floors of the building at about 83% and the value of the project excluding the fit out was 7 million. So just touching on the brief from Tombola, it was, um, it was developed to develop a new landmark headquarter building in Sunderland and deliver an innovative office design to attract and re retain staff. This was one of the most pertinent points of the of the, of the brief. They were um, they were keen to attract the best in class within the uh, tech industry, and uh, they really wanted to provide a flexible and socially enriching environment, which um, you'll see in more detail later on with regards to the uh, commitment to provide social hub on the on the full ground floor of the building. But in addition to that, they were also um, keen for us to deliver a legacy project for um, Tombola and the, and the city of Sunderland. So a little bit on the location. It's located on the south side of the River Weir in Sunderland, just five minutes from the, uh, the city centre. It's a riverside location. So looking from the north south, we've got on the um, the west side, we've got Sunderland University Halls of Residence and then the existing site, was it, which was effectively just a derelict site um, for the last few years. And uh, we've got some uh, trees on, on this, or we had some trees on the site. To the back, which is really interesting, is the Quayside Exchange Building and a historical building, which was once the uh, Sunderland uh, Civic Centre. And then where Tombola was founded in Wylam Wharf, which is again a listed building and uh, an old bonded warehouse. Uh, recently, Tombola have uh, purchased Keyside House, which we'll, uh, we'll mention later on in the, in the presentation. But also looking back at the historic uh, context, we, um, we can see here the site identified in yellow and uh, it was very much always seen as part of the, um, the Port of Sunderland and uh, had a quite, a quite a tight urban, urban grain uh, running through to the east to the port. Um, Industrial Revolution, 1800s, late 1800s, and um, we can just make out the site here. This is the listed building, the Rose Line building, where the business was founded. And then on the majority of the site, we've got the Scotia Engine Works, which supported um, a lot of the shipbuilding, which was located on the on the north banks of, uh, of the River Weir. So it was an invited competition originally, and this was one of the submitted images. Um, and it was really in direct response to the client's brief. They had a, an aspiration to effectively recreate what they had in the Rose Line building, which is this building here located on the left. Um, they wanted to replicate that um, to the west of the existing site with a small annex building to help um, in uh, sort of create a, a north facing courtyard which looked over the uh, which looked over the river towards the Sunderland University campus. However, um, we didn't feel that that was the, the right response for this site and, and we really took our cues from the uh, Scotia Engine Works building in so much as trying to provide a building which uh, created better linkages between the uh, the main office accommodation. So we developed a couple of party diagrams here. And um, so on the left hand side, uh, effectively a, a ground floor plan arrangement looking to create office floor plates down the north and south wings with the central atrium which creates and strengthens key views and linkages back through to the um, Rose Line building located here to the right. 
And then with regards to the uh, cross section, we really wanted to respond to that tight urban grain of Low Street. So we had a very defensible um, face to the building adjacent Low Street. And then we've created this triple pitched uh, roof form, which then returns uh, down on the north elevation, but stops short of the ground just to help um, strengthen the links, the visual links from uh, the ground floor social hub north over the river. So these are just a couple of diagrams that we were um, we submitted with the competition entry just to uh, articulate those alternative proposals. So the link between the new building and the existing was very important. And then creating office accommodation on the upper floor levels with a social hub on the ground floor. So the floor plans, just quickly talk through those. Uh, main entrance here uh, on the east facade, straight in to the central atrium, which is a stunning um, sort of vista as you arrive into the building. To the north, we've got the cafe collaboration area and servery um, to the back. Uh, and then on the south side, we've got um, some office accommodation, small office, uh, boardroom, and then a gym located against Low Street and then you're into changing and sort of back of house. So that's the ground floor plan. Then we've got the first floor and second floor plans, virtually identical. Uh, we've got the main office accommodation located on the north and south wings, 40 um, work uh, spaces within each wing. Um, based on a density of around one per 10 square meters. Then we've got these collaboration areas at the end of the wings, which have got um, fantastic sort of French farmyard tables and uh, all of the latest IT equipment for um, presenting and collaborating in those areas. Then at the back, we've got um, two circulation staircases and um, back of house WCs and support facilities. So these were some of the original CGIs that we developed. So you can start to appreciate that the space that we were creating externally with a Keyside Exchange building, Tombola House, and what's not in this picture, but just behind us here, the Rose Line building. Uh, and then this um, fantastic east elevation with the uh, triple pitch and then wrapping down and just stopping short on that north elevation. Um, this was the second CGI, which was the central atrium space. So upon arrival, this is what you're met with, uh, which you'll see in just a second. Um, so if I just break out of this presentation, I'll drop into Google and we will have a quick look around. This is available um, for anyone. Just type in at uh, Tombola Sunderland and um, you can through Street View enter the building and um, have a have a tour about at your leisure. So um, this is Keyside Exchange which sits to the south uh, which links right through visually to create this external uh, plaza and then with the building uh, located to the west of the site. I mentioned earlier about leaving a legacy for Sunderland, uh, one of the key, key client briefs. Um, Quite early on, we made the decision to keep all of the public realm open. So the quayside, which is absolutely public space, is all left open. Um, just a couple of little um, staircases up into the space. So this is fully open to the public during, um, well, all the time. And during the summer, it's, it's quite a lively space with people utilizing, members of the public utilizing the lawn and some of the bench seating here looking over the river. So this is the, um, the view north over to the university campus um, designed by B, uh, BDP a number of years ago. And then to the east, you've got a, a fantastic outlook over the uh, port of Sunderland. Um, so that's the riverside aspect. So up to the main entrance of the building. So as you enter the building, you're straight into the central atrium space, which is um, pretty impressive. So we've got this uh, Heller Road staircase in, in the center and these um, steps up to the first floor are, are effectively used for general circulation day to day from the first floor. Um, at the back we've got the uh, feature wall uh, with the Columba brick and uh, we've etched into that the tumble sign, just a, a nice reference back to the historical context in so much as uh, the old industrial Businesses used to engrave their names into the into the fabric of the building. 
And then we've got the reception desk on the left hand side, and then you're straight through to um, the sort of social hub uh, to the north where we've got informal collaboration space there to the right, and then the, uh, the main cafe space. So if I just jump through to the back of the cafe, we can look back. So fantastic views out over the over the river to the north, and um, you can quite clearly see um, within this shot we've got a, a steel frame. So we've been very very particular around the um, the M and E installation, all of the controls. We've tried to uh, control the location of those and and uh, and treat those. Uh, in a black matte finish so that they uh, quite quickly disappear into the into the background. Um, I love the shot here just simply because it, it shows the uh, the sort of uncluttered soffit of the uh, concrete precast panels um, which were all uh, constructed off-site and uh, contain um, some heating and cooling pipe work. That's the cafe area. We've utilized all of the space so beneath the um, the Heller up staircase, we've located uh, an additional collaboration area. So we've got, uh, this is located under the stair, the main stair in the atrium, and we've got uh, the latest IT um, AV equipment there, blackboards, uh, lounge chairs, and then we've got three little snugs that just sit beneath the, uh, the rake of the staircase, again with all the latest IT products and all of the uh, fixings all hidden behind uh, the uh, bespoke joinery. So if I take you up to first floor level. So you get a great view down at the top of the Heller upstairs to the central atrium, the main entrance. Um, I'll just pan around. Um, we managed through close dialogue with the structural engineer to avoid any uh, tie beams and uh, really strengthen the um, the internal appearance of the atrium without having you know any cross uh, members um, just through a portal framed solution structure uh, just very clean edges in terms of uh, the balcony edges with a glass balustrade. Uh, on first floor, we've got the conference room, which sits behind um, the LCD screen. And then we've got the uh, CEO's office on first floor. So if I just break into the main floor plate. So we'll start with the collaboration area at the end. So at the end of each floor plate, we've got um, the collaboration zones, as I mentioned earlier, the, the sort of farmyard, French farmyard style table uh, collaboration area. We've got hidden storage beneath the AV equipment and um, we'll take you down one of the typical floor plates. So we'll work with, uh, with Vitra on the uh, furniture solution, the desks specifically. And um, what we did provide in terms of lighting was just background lighting. So we didn't flood everywhere with 400 lux at task uh, level, just to avoid having uh, endless light fittings suspended from the, the roof. We really did want to keep this clutter free. So um, the uh, lighting, the task lighting here, which is developed, um, bespoke developed by Vitra and um, provides any additional lighting that people may need. So if we trundle along to the east elevation, you can see straight out uh, to the Quayside Exchange Building, which forms um, this effective courtyard. And then we've got the listed Rose Line Building, which we're currently refurbishing, and that's due to complete next month. But you can see the, the views that we're, um, we're exploiting here to the east down to the port and to the north over the uh, university campus. So that's a typical um, floor plate. The secondary staircases at the rear, again, we've um, invested heavily in the, in the design of these. So we've got plate steel um, staircase with the American white oak treads. And uh, again, very similar with regards to the exposed soffit and the suspended light fittings. And then just pull that staircase off the edge just to try and uh, appreciate the form of, uh, of the staircase a little bit more. To drop up to or take us up to the second floor level. 
So again, the end of a typical floor plate, you've got the collaboration area and then straight into the WC's back of house kitchenette, which are just located in here. Um, then you get a real appreciation of the vaulted ceiling that we've created. So we've got a Hunter Douglas um, timber ceiling, again, American oak. Um, and then as Carlos mentioned earlier, a sea of roof lights. So you can see there's some central roof lights and there's also two down each elevation, which are wrapped up over the, um, the eaves. And uh, again, just pro provide some fantastic views out for the, um, for the occupiers. And you can see the Rose Line building there. And then we've got the CEO's office, um, Phil Cronin. Again, right in the center of it with great views externally and also internally. So if I drop back, as I say, that's available to anyone just through Google. If I drop back to the presentation, sorry. Just pick up. So uh, the color palette for the uh, development was really um, refined through um, some Lowry paint paintings from the 1960s. So we got our inspiration in terms of color hues from from that palette, and we worked with uh, um, Pedersen Tegel uh, over in Copenhagen with uh, the Columba brickwork, and uh, and we tried to match the colors. Uh, with those hues, and this is just a, an image of uh, of Phil, the CEO, um, creating one of the bricks and themselves. We also had several test panels erected on site uh, just to determine the um, the uh, mortar color, uh, the mortar joint, and the um, the coursing that we would provide. And we, we, we finally went for a, a random course to avoid uh, some of these express purbans, as you see on the sample there. We also uh, engaged with Ibstock in the UK to uh, provide the uh, Tombola uh, etched uh, bricks. So they did that through um, water. Uh, water cutting. Um, we also had some precast panels fabricated to create that express triple pitch uh, roof. Um, so they were built off site, uh, mortared on site so that the, the mortar color was consistent and then lifted, uh, lifted into position. So we got Pedersen Tegel to uh, create a bespoke roof tile for us from the same clay that we chose for the uh, the Columba brick for the walls. So this really provided us with a uh, an opportunity to create, as per the original party uh, sketches, uh, a homogenous skin to the building, which was uh, as proved really successful in terms of uh, the visual appearance. These are just some shots from the professional photography. Some great reflections on the on the buildings, uh, tying it back to its local context, the adjacent um, the port of Sunderland. Um, we also we really tried hard to ensure that we didn't end up with a cluttered eastern facade. So it gets a lot of low uh, light in the morning into the building, and with it being a a, a, a building for techies and web developers, um, there was a real nervousness about glare. So what we did was we introduced a uh, sage glass, which is an electrochromatic glass from uh, San Goban. And that allowed us to avoid any unnecessary um, external bricele, which uh, could have worked against the um, the sort of strength of the elevation that we had created. Um, so this is it, and it's um, virtually a full tint and uh, what's really nice about it is you get this mirrored effect and you, and you can actually see uh, the listed building adjacent the Rose Line building where the business was founded on, on this photograph. And then it, it goes right through to just clear state, clear state glass. So this is just a, a photograph um, showing that in, a, in an evening setting. So you've got great transparency um, through that um, main elevation. These are just some photographs from the inside, showing it on sort of clear state to the left hand side, and then a, a sort of mid tint uh, to the right. 
so you can get an appreciation for the the, the levels that 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 provides. So as part of the heating and cooling strategy I mentioned earlier, um, precast concrete planks. So we've cast in those um, slinkies and uh, effectively in the winter, there's hot water pumped through those for a radiant heating effect. And uh, in the summer, um, cold water um, to provide uh, cool. Uh, the ventilation strategy is all around the perimeter. And we've got some of the construction photographs here just showing the precast planks um, being installed. On the left hand side, you can see just some steelwork picking up there. So what we tried to do, uh, well, quite successfully, was lift all of the steelwork so that, that none of that steelwork was uh, visible from the underside. So it really is just that flat soffit. And then we just applied a, a key on paint finish uh, to the finish just to provide a little bit of color fastness across the skin. D completely different strategy on the top floor. So we had to go for radiant heating panels on the top floor, which are hidden behind um, the Hunter Douglas uh, ceiling. So they were again just painted out black so that they weren't visible. And mm -hmm. um, the ceiling just um, was slung beneath that quite successfully. A um, little bit on the interior design. Um, I might need to press you a bit, Ronnie. Yep, I'm nearly there. So we worked um, with several suppliers on the furniture for, for high density solutions for the collaboration areas, the cafe areas, uh, medium density for the boardrooms, the meeting rooms, and then low density um, solutions for the, the, the main office spaces. So um, last slide. Uh, we've got Tombola House, it's been operational since the end of uh, 2018. Um, Rose Line Building, we mentioned that, that's due for completion next month. Um, so um, some additional um, staff moving into that. And then we are looking at the potential for a, a net zero carbon solution for the uh, Keyside House building, which would be uh, taking some of the building back to its original frame, uh, extending it and um, providing um, a reclad. Um, so lot, lots happening. The business mm -hmm. is growing and, and there's a real aspiration there to create a, a, a campus on the, uh, on the river's edge at Sunderland. Well, thanks a lot, Ronnie. Um, I, I'm, I'm actually picking up on Jamie's question here because I was very keen on the idea how this has actually had an effect on staff retention or drawing new staff in. Has, has that new building changed the way that they employ or the way they retain? Yeah, absolutely. It was one of the, the key aspirations from the very beginning. They um, certainly in the Northeast were, you know, the head offices, they were losing a lot of staff to tech businesses up in Newcastle. So it was uh, one of the primary aims where they needed to provide uh, what they wanted was the best office space in the Northeast. And um, they're certainly up there. And uh, yeah, there's, you know, the feedback in terms of um, staff retention and uh, attracting the right level of staff has, has been very positive. Okay, brilliant. Um, a lot of the questions here, and there have been a number, are you've, I think you've pretty much covered them. Certainly things about the MEP installations and solar shading, because obviously we're talking about the saint Gobain glass that you used. Um, some of the, someone, Rolf here, has asked, where is the building sprinkled? No, um, no, building wasn't sprinklered, so it didn't. Um, we had a um, fire strategy, and uh, yeah, no, no need for that. Okay, great. And uh, someone here has asked. We always get this question: Did you use an approved inspector? Curious about building control and pragmatism with regard to handrails and compliance within the central atrium. Yeah, we used a private inspector, but yes. I don't don't recall there being any. Um, specific issues around that. Mm, people always ask about the staircases. Um, my personal one was, I, I mean, it looks great. The express, express structure is fantastic. I mean, I really like the way that you've kind of really subtly kind of hidden all the MEP as well. It's really nicely done. I mean, there's radiant panels and ceiling are brilliant. But how do you deal with um, surfaces themselves? Because it looks like an awful lot of heart, you know, you've got concrete soffits, steel structure, how are you dealing with, I mean, it's an open plan office. How are you dealing with acoustics there? Yeah, the acoustics was, um, it was, it was discussed at length with uh, Apex Acoustics in the Northeast here. And uh, I think there was a nervousness originally around, you know, as, as you've quietly 
quite rightly pointed out, all of the hard surfaces. What has helped enormously, enormously is having the brickwork uh, returning to the inside face of the elevations, and that helps to um, to reduce the reverberation times uh, within the building. Obviously, a carpet finish within the office spaces. We've got on the ground floor. We had originally thought that we would go down the polished concrete route. We've actually gone for more of a retail solution. It's a, a Senso uh, resin floor. Um, but again, that helps just dampen some of the noise. So in terms of floor finishes, it is quite soft. Wall finishes, we've got lots of uh, opportunity there to reflect the, um, the sound and reduce those reverberation times. And then on the top floor, um, we've obviously got the Hunter Douglas ceiling and then several layers uh, back from that in terms of the radiant panels. And that all helps just to to dissipate the um, the sort of um, the bouncing around of the noise. So okay. it's worked, worked, worked quite well. How did you, in terms of the engineering, kind of work with the forces? And, you know, like you say, you've got this like portal frame rather than tie beam. I mean, you know, obviously having tie beams would have changed the internal quality of the space quite significantly. How did you manage to kind of... You know, yeah, we uh, we worked with um, shed engineers um, on that, and what we finally went with, I can remember going around the houses on this um, a few times, but what we went with in the main columns was box sections as opposed to uh, universal columns, and uh, they're just a lot more efficient. Um, um, they were hollow, we didn't fill them with concrete or anything. But um, that certainly helped. And then the connections were all portalized. And um, so there's a bit more steel work in the connections to avoid those um, those tie beams across the um, across the base of the pitches. Uh, and just another question from Rolf saying, was there any fresh air from opening windows? And supposedly asking whether yeah. there's a kind of level of passive ventilation that you can accommodate in the building. Yeah, yeah, it is it is quite a passive solution. We've got openable windows on both sides. And uh, it was one of the first things that I noticed when I visited site. Um, it was just such a quiet environment. So uh, we decided, you know, on that on that cert first visit, site visit that we would have openable windows and, and go for a passive solution as opposed to air conditioning. We've got one air conditioned building in there and that's the gymnasium. I mean, it looks like a great building, I have to say. I'm sure it really has worked with staff retention. I mean, it looks like a, a lovely environment to be working in. Certainly, and I imagine one of the best environments in the city. I can't imagine that it isn't. Um, thank you very much indeed. We could talk about it longer, but obviously I, I am time uh, constrained here. Um, great to look at it. Nice to see it again. And um, thanks for that presentation. It's drawn a lot of interest from, from the viewers for sure. Uh, right. And uh, look forward to seeing the whole campus actually being developed. See that you know when you've actually re reworked the whole kind of waterfront there. It looked fantastic. Absolutely, yeah. Good stuff. Thank uh, you very much. Thank you very much, Ronnie. Cheers. Uh, and as our final sponsor presentation now, running slightly late, but hopefully we'll still manage to finish on time. Uh, we is coming from Rockwool, and we're talking to Roofing Specification Manager Luke Morgan. Uh, Luke's worked in the construction industry for seven years, providing technical roof guidance to clients and their designers. Uh, joining the team in 2015, uh, he's interested in fabric first approaches to design and construction and as a roofing specification manager, provides a range of supports to clients, designers and system suppliers. Um, hello Luke, I believe you're going to be talking about the American Express HQ at Burgess Hill and the refurbishing roofs for fire protection. Sussex House, in my uh, quick look at it, was actually Pringle Brandon, now Perkins and Will, an office for 1,200 employees. I'll be interested to find out how many of them are actually back using the building, Luke. And um, obviously a cleanly debated topic at the moment. Uh, Luke's discussing Rockwell's work here and issues of fire protection in the building. Yeah. Luke. Thank you very much, Carlos. So let me just share my screen. Hopefully you can see that. You might need to put your volume up a bit. I don't know if I'm... Oh, um... sorry. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me better now? Can you hear me? Yeah. Right. Okay, fine. Um, so looking into, uh, into this case study actually I think uh, a couple of our products actually have already been touched on in other uh, presentations including our uh, sister company Rock Fon with the mono acoustic ceilings 
Um, so, so this one's talking more about external insulation, which is what the, the main rock or group does. And um, specifically, we refurbished the roof um, on the American Express building in Burgess Hill. Um, just to give you a bit of background about Rockwell, first of all, it is um, a very, um, it's, it's not the most interesting of products, but it is um, an extremely important one. It's, uh, and, and less, less interesting, quite frankly, is quite important for insulation. So it's made by melting down stone um, at about 1,500 degrees Celsius and spin it into wool. And all it does is stop air movement. So it traps air within the, within the wool. And stops it from moving about, which which is a which is a massive benefit to insulation. It means that it's never going to lose its thermal performance as long as it keeps its dimensional stability, and that uh, and it's never going to um, change because it's never going to seek equilibrium with the with the air outside it. So it's always going to perform at the same level um, for the lifetime of the building, which means you don't have to um, go through the process of changing the insulation years down the line. So this project, um, it was an existing roof, a Sussex house. Um, it was in a very poor state of repair and need of refurbishment. Um, project consisted of two roof areas, about 2,800 square meters in total. Um, and we replaced it with a new uh, liquid system um, over the existing bitumen cupboard. Um, and it was actually a vermiculite um, insulation that was used. So um, it was constructed by weight and um, the roof of the tractor was Heights Maintenance. Um, I don't think Heights Maintenance are, are around anymore. And it's, it's um, Pringle, Brandon, Perkins and Will that were the uh, architects who, who now I, I've only been told today is uh, now just Perkins and Will. So it was a challenge. Um, there were an even surfaces, um, which, which the Rockwell product surprisingly does um, lend itself to. So because it's a mineral wool, it can um, take up those, those undulated surfaces um, and um, the undulations on the deck, which, which then can uh, create that perfect finish. Um, one of the main problems with insulation, insulation is quite difficult to install correctly. Um, one of the main problems you get is if you obviously create um, gaps between the substrate and the insulation, then you can end up with thermal bypass, um, which, which completely, almost completely negates your insulation performance. So, so it's important to make sure you get it, it installed correctly. The roof in this building formed a means of escape um, and it was an insurance requirement. So normally you'd, you'd potentially be looking at 30 minutes requirement. In this uh, case, we are looking at 60 minutes fire resistance from the insurers and then thermal performance of 0.18 to, um, to comply with, um, with the approved documents. The solution, um, so it was hard rock multiplex, um, which, which was used, um, so, so it was a concrete structure, um, but they weren't confident that the concrete structure alone could supply the fire rating required. Um, they also wanted the insulation because it was an escape route to be non-combustible, um, bearing in mind that the triflex uh, Protec liquid membrane that was used would have been a combustible um, product, but we're, we're thinking about fuel loads and things like that here. So we're, we're looking to really limit the fuel load on, on escape routes um, for the very simple reason that it's, it's very difficult to use an escape route that is on fire. And so we have to try and protect them and, and really keep the fuel load to a minimum as you would in escape stairwells and anything like that. Um, so, so it was installed provided, providing pretty much all the solutions in one. Um, mineral coated glass tissue fleece allows for any membrane to be attached to it. So we've actually tested with bitumen, torch applied bitumen, self-adhesive bitumen, um, adhered single ply membranes uh, and even GRP. So I think we're one of the few insulations that can actually have GRP applied directly to it. Um, and so horizontal and vertical joints have to be staggered when we're talking about fire performance as well. Um, I did notice in this uh, particular image that we have got a little gap here um, in the insulation, which, uh, which, is, which is probably on the cusp of, um, of, of creating a thermal problem. But things like that in the fire um, protection element of it aren't such a major issue because we are staggering the joints. Um, so we, we get that um, additional performance. We've tested to the new standard as well. So we had the S476 testing, which would have been used at this time to achieve the um, one hour requirement. Um, but we've now tested the BSEN 1365 um, part two standard as well. Um, the main difference is being that they increase the pressure difference between the, um, the, the fire side and non-fire side. 
And the other thing is that they apply more energy, so not more temperature, but more energy um, to get to the, um, to, so it's the same temperature curve, but more energy applied, more energy means it's, uh, it's much harder to pass the fire test. So a lot of products that previously passed the PS476 system are now failing in the um, European standard of test. So as it's a roof, um, you have to achieve um, the three. So not just integrity and insulation as you do with a lot of wall systems and, um, and, and certainly our ability to the bats would only need to achieve the integrity and insulation, but stability, the roof has to remain in place. A collapsed roof is no longer um, obviously stopping fire from getting through. Um, and, and so this, um, this really was um, what they asked for. They asked for 60 minutes fire protection. They, uh, they wanted to achieve the thermal value, um, and, and this is what met those, uh, those requirements. The other things that you get with the Rocco product that, you, that they, they didn't ask for, but they will get as a result of using it, is, is thermal consistency. So Rockwell isn't dependent on external temperature. Um, yes, we test the same as everyone at 10 degrees Celsius, but thermal performance increases the lower the external temperature is. So it's uh, reliant on trapped air as, as uh, temperature decreases, um, air becomes more dense and it, um, and it stops more heat from passing through. Um, it does get worse as it gets warmer. Um, that's pretty much the same with all insulations, but it's, it's, a, it's a linear relationship with uh, external air. You do not get that with um, insulation materials that, that don't rely on trapped air. Um, so, so it is a benefit of trapped air. Um, as I said, the other benefit they're going to have is that this insulation will last a lifetime in the building and beyond. The building's already been there, I think, in, in around about 45 years. Um, so it's, um, this, this will now continue for the lifetime of the building. Hopefully the next time they need to refurbish the roof, they will simply um, overlay it with, a, with another, um, maybe a 30 mil um, recovery board that we sell, same product as, as you can see there, and just overlay and just overlay a membrane on it and, um, and the thermal performance will remain intact. So the result uh, using Rockwell insulation simplified the overall design, achieved on-site efficiency gains and increased confidence in the performance of the roof builder. Um, so being non-combustible Rockwell insulation removed any concerns about zoning, compartment walls and things like that where you are required to achieve that A2 S3D2 rating over the top of compartment walls. So, so there wasn't an issue with that. Um, and um, where access is required for plant equipment. So the escape routes uh, remained um, less uh, in place. The intrinsic fire performance uh, exceeded the required 60 minute fire rating. So um, 210 mil, which is required to achieve the 0.18 U value, um, is, um, will achieve two hours fire rating um, from, from above and below. Um, obviously from below, you're also relying on the structure as well, but the structure would provide um, an hour, so so the system will achieve an hour. And that is everything. A very short presentation from me, hopefully, and I've stayed on time, I hope. You are you're perfectly on time. Thank you very much, Lee. Fantastic. Um, I was interested when you were talking about, just when you were talking when you were applying the product, um, you you made a mention of the fact that staggered joints affect the performance. Can you tell me why, you know, what's the best way of actually applying the rock wall so that, you know, because I'm kind of interested in the idea of why a staggered joint would, but just just if you could just explain that to me. So so the idea of the staggered joint is that um, heat can get up in between the products. So so because actually one, one of the downfalls actually of the roofing product is there's a, a rigid um, it's a rigid insulation, so the, the edges don't knit together as well as they do with the with the less dense um, insulation, which means that gives a path for heat to travel through. Um, in standard fire stopping internally, you use an intumescent sealant or something to sort that solve that problem. But in in situation where you've got um, rigid boards with gaps in between, the board overlaying the top of it um, stops that heat from getting right the way up to the non-fire side. So. So that's that's where the difference comes in. And were you talking? Were you, were you talking about the when you're talking about this additional layer? You're saying over time you could actually kind of apply other rock wall layers in order to kind of like give ad additional longevity. Could you just explain that concept a bit more? Well, well the membrane will only last, I think, um, probably twenty to thirty years generally. Uh, waterproofing membranes will. Um, so 
when when they need to replace the membrane, um, rather than having to pull up the whole system and uh, and and replace the whole system, they can just simply overlay it with a with a thirty mil product and then put a new membrane on top. Um, so created a separated layer. Um, you could also, if if the membrane is available, just overlay it with a brand new membrane uh, as it is. Not necessarily add any more insulation at all. Okay, excellent. Much for your explanation. Um, you are perfectly on time. We're now hitting 11.15, which is precisely when we should be finishing, which Perfect. the only person who's actually run out of any time whatsoever is me to do any closing remarks. <laughs> I would just like to make a couple of um, uh, observations, really, just in, in reference to, the, to the, the three kind of building speakers, was really how, I mean, just basic the idea certainly from Amy Frias, the discussion I had with Amy Frierson was really about how fundamental the changes to our working lives have been in the last 16 months. It kind of really places it in context, this quite prescient book about how we need to kind of like change our whole approach to the work-life balance. And I think that, you know, the, the nature of the, the, her picking up on that at the time, you know, obviously pre-pandemic, but the fact that we've had the pandemic in the meantime, I think it actually makes will probably make some really really good insights from that book. Um, I think it's quite interesting. I mean, having looked at the Promega HQ, I mean, not only the architecture, which was you know already has a very kind of homely feel about it anyway, um, but that looking at the interiors of architecture PLB's building, how that it really makes it feel like from the, and I'm assuming the recent photographs of how low density is going to become the norm and how much space we actually need now in this socially distanced environment. Something that's obviously very keen to the RIBA for sure, because that's how the whole environment is currently being reworked in order to um, allow people to work at distance and at lower densities. Uh, and I think with Ryder Architecture's um, work at Tom Bowler, I suppose it's the idea that, you know, given these large open spaces, how we probably have to be more flexible and future-proofed, I suppose, really to allow for quite radical changes, in, perhaps in layouts, whether that be for whatever reason, you know, great, it could be in the future, future cellularization. But the fact that, um, the, the, you know, these kind of open spaces are kind of allowing for the for this possible um, future of work that we have. So I'd like to thank all of them, Amy, Joshua Ray, and uh, Ronnie Graham from Ryder for their input, which I think was wonderful. And uh, thank you very much to all the uh, uh, watchers too, who were giving their who were giving their own kind of queries and questions about the projects that we saw. And uh, a final thanks again to our um, webinar sponsors. That would be Ben Hancock from Oscar, Oscar Acoustics, 3M's Jack Halewood, and Luke Morgan from Rockwell, who's, without whose um, support we wouldn't be able to run these. So thank you very much indeed, everyone. Uh, and I look forward to, whether it be me or not, I'm not quite sure, but for our next presentation in the near future. Uh, and at 11.17, I think we can sign off and you can all go for your loo break or a cup of tea. Thank you very much indeed. And hopefully we'll all meet together virtually soon.